Hello and welcome to this exciting episode of the Media Tech Podcast. Today we are joined by graduate Ton Tran. How you doing? Good. Good. Filmmaker, DP, what else? A uh, producer, editor? Awesome. Those work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Graduate of 2012 and the digital film and video program in the Dallas campus mm -hmm. um, from MediaTek. Um, at first, I swore that you were just a grade above me, but thinking about it when we were doing our interview, um, I think you were two or three grades above me because uh, your final film, which was called Penumbra, um, mm -hmm. I helped grip or something, and I think that was... A, a project we had to do in our first class, if I remember right. So you must have been in your final class when I was in my first. Oh yeah, yeah. We were in 401, in the in the middle of creating our final film for mm -hmm. our final project. Yeah. So, yeah, you must have been three or four. So MediaTek's laid out a little bit differently now with their um, tracks and things. It's not like 101, 201, whatever. I see. But you were at least two or three semesters ahead of me, I think. Um, regardless though, great to have you. Um, on you. October 25th, give or take a few days, we're gonna have a video on this channel, if you're on, on the YouTube channel, um, all about Ton and his background. Uh, but on this podcast, I wanna talk to him a little bit about uh, gear, his editing process. He's got an amazing setup right behind us that we'll get into a little bit. Uh, but first, um, tell us a, a little bit about your background. Um, you are, uh, your family's from Vietnam. Yeah, so my family's from Vietnam. I wasn't born here. I was born in Vietnam and I moved here whenever I was three years old. So I'm pretty native American, <laughs> as, as you would say, 27 years. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, with that, even before Media Tech, I was a, a, a student filmmaker and I would learn through YouTube University mm. or just like going out there and just like doing it through trial and error. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure that's like a lot of us, you know, just going out there and just shooting things and throwing in the edit bay and see if it makes sense. For sure. I mean, YouTube now, we actually have a whole podcast talking to Eric Jewell, uh, which before I get to that, by the way, we're in his home office. Uh, there are two adorable corgis running around, so you might hear them barking or playing with uh, my wife, the awesome camera woman back there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so th we had a podcast a few weeks ago talking with Eric Jewell, who is the head of the film program, you know, um, in mm -hmm. Dallas, mm -hmm. talking about um, YouTube. And a lot of kids now are going through, they're having to ask themselves, should I go to school or should I just watch YouTube videos? Because I mean, conceivably it's possible, right? That you could learn a lot of what you need to just on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that you kind of went full circle there, that you started and you actually attained career status as a photographer and, and videographer having mm -hmm. just gone through YouTube, but then you decided to make the jump and go to a film school like MediaTek. Like what kind of, what played into that decision? Oh yeah, so you know, with, with MediaTek, there was a structured curriculum. Mm -hmm. It's very objective in like what they want to teach you and you have goals you have accountability and you have a network of filmmakers and mentors you know that think alike like you and they're very excited about film very excited about you know creating video and that's pretty much like the difference between going to school for film and then trying to learn youtube you know university yeah. trying to go out there and, and do it on yourself um i mean it is possible i would say like to learn through youtube but for me, it's like, you know, I, I got to see both sides of that coin whenever I first started. And having that was like, I can see like, what was the benefit in both sides. Um, but for me, man, like I, I, I loved MediaTek whenever I went there, all the resources that were available, the people that were there, we were bouncing ideas. We were like getting us all fired up and like having that accountability just makes you a better, you know, filmmaker, especially in this, in this industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the level of collaboration, that was my favorite thing was there were at least like two guys in my class that on every project, regardless of whether it was a group project, we'd always be helping each other out. And, mm -hmm. and the deadlines, too, that was one of the biggest things for me of, of the college experience with, with MediaTek was like if you're on YouTube, you know, you might spend six months working on something that you're really proud of. But having a deadline is so huge to me and really, mm -hmm. at least for me, helps up me out for success, you know? Yeah, no, I agree, man. Awesome. Yeah. So having those deadlines and, you know, e even if you feel good about a project, it's like it's different through a person that is mentored and has done it for, you know, decades. 
they can look at the project and they'll give you a numbered grade rather than a subjective grade. Yeah. Anybody can say it's good or it's bad, but it's like that really doesn't really put you on a scale that you can kind of understand. Through a objective grade, it's like very critique and it's very, it gives you criticism in order to be a better filmmaker, mm -hmm. in order to be successful, especially when it comes to this commercial industry where, you know, you know, it's also an art, but it's also a business at the same time. Yeah, and I mean, if we want to get into it a little bit, there were some specific projects at MediaTek um, yeah. that I really valued. Um, the commercial was a big one, um, and I'm sure I'm going to pull footage from that for the the your grad you did because that's still on the YouTube channel. Your the commercial what was that for Acura or something? Oh, for the uh, Lexus. Yeah, the yeah, le yeah the Lexus. First, yeah, spec was. commercial. Yeah, yeah the spec yeah. commercial. Um, and then obviously the Faro and film, which the students still do. Um, but yeah, so since graduating, you now are you work on uh, commercials, music videos, documentaries, wedding films. Tell us a little bit about that. All right. So my main my main um, my main thing when it comes to like professional. Uh, I would say I'm more of a media producer, uh, especially when it comes to the, the film side. Uh, but my main three roles that I partake in is director, DP, and also editing. Mm -hmm. Being a producer kind of ties all that in together because producing gathers all of the elements together in order to make the project happen. Sometimes the project is small, you can do it by yourself. But most of the time, it's like a project can be complicated and would need different people that you have to reach into, whether it's sound, whether it's camera, whether it's uh, editing, whether it's like an associate producer getting getting help, you know, gather things together. Mm -hmm. um, but I do a lot of producing, but my specialization is probably cinematography because I was a photographer back in the day, so it kind of helped me just transition into yeah. cinematography. So... <laughs> well, I mean, even during, uh, you know, when I knew you at MediaTek, um, I've always thought, among the other things that you're obviously very talented in, shooting seems to be, like, when I look at a, a, something that you shot, it's like, wow, that looks particularly great, you know? Thank you. Um, and so with that in mind, you have some, I don't know if the camera can see it, but a huge camera wall over there. I want to talk a little bit about your gear preferences and, and all of that. So tell us, I, I think you shot Penumbra on your own camera, didn't you, way back then? Yeah. yeah. What was that? Yeah, yeah. So we had the option of shooting, um, you know, using one of the cameras from school, um, you know, I think back in the day we had like the five the the five D Mark II, which was a beast at the time um, at least. Yeah, <laughs> um, we we had the um, the AF one hundred, yeah. which was more of like a broadcast uh, video camera. Yeah, um, I think the five D was the one that was for the like mainly reserved for the final film, wasn't it? Yeah, it was mainly yeah. reserved for like you know the three hundred one and the four hundred one students yeah. for the commercial projects. Um, I actually chose to shoot it on the GH two. The reason why is because the 5D Mark II at the time, it wasn't really uh, designed for video, but you could do video on it. Mm -hmm. It was more of a photo camera that did video. Yeah. So the reason why I did that was I, we shot it on the GH2 because uh, Panasonic was actually in favor of creating a DSLR that was just tailored for video. Yeah. And also because like um, having a 5D Mark II that's a full frame camera. That thing gets heavy. Yeah. You know, so being <laughs> being on set like eight to 10 hours a day for your final film, you don't want to carry around like a five pound camera versus like a two pound camera. Yeah. But we, we did use uh, the Canon EF lenses. Oh, nice. Which were really sharp. All we had to do was put an adapter on it and bam. Yeah. And we were off to the races. Cool. Um, but when it, com when it, when it comes to a preference of, of camera, I, I've loved the, the GH series. Um, I started off with the two. Um, eventually graduated to the GH4, mm -hmm. now the 5, and now I actually have the Panasonic S1H, which is, right which is the biggest, which is the full frame camera. Um, and I've been a micro four thirds sensor my pretty much my entire career, yeah, up until now. Um, but you know, there's definitely pros and cons when it comes to a small sensor versus a big sensor. A small sensor, a lot of things are a bit sharper. Uh, depth of field is, I, I would say it's not non-existent, but there's less depth of field when it comes to it. But you do get a lighter package and you get a little bit better autofocusing 
when it comes to a smaller package because you're not hunting for depth of field. I didn't even think about time, that, dude. Interesting. Yeah, that's cool. So the uh, S1H, this is sort of the video offshoot of a of another full frame Panasonic, right? Is that correct? Yes, that is the third generation of the S1. Um, they have the S1, which is the 30% uh, video camera, 70% 70, 70 uh, photo camera. Mm -hmm. And then you have the SLR, which is more specialized in photography. Gotcha. And now they made the S1H, which is purely a, I would say 50% video and then 50% photo camera. Gotcha. What so, do you use it for most? Video. Yeah. Video of course, but also when I, you know, when I, whenever I want to come back to my photography days, I'm just like, it's, it's, it's literally <laughs> the S1 yeah. and a video camera as well. So I love it. It, it just makes so much sense. It kind of compares to like the A7 line, doesn't it? A7, yeah. A7, uh, S2. Yeah. Yeah. It does. It does compare to that. Um, it is a hybrid, um, like the A7, um, a7 III, mm -hmm. it is a hybrid just like that, uh, but it's a lot bigger. Yeah. It's a bit bulkier. <laughs> it's a bit camera. Yeah. It's a bit bulkier, but um, you know, um, Panasonic did it because um, for cooling, for cooling issues, and it also, if you look in the back, there's like a big fan. Oh, right, right here. So that's yeah. a that's the first camera that sh that has like a fan like that for a DSLR. What lens mount is that? It's a Leica lens mount. Interesting. Yeah. And then your, I guess, what would be your other main camera sitting right behind us? So my other camera is the uh, the Blackmagic uh, Pocket Cinema 4K. Mm -hmm. um, I actually bought this because I already had uh, four third lenses, and all I had to do was get the body and use the same lenses yeah. that I have now. Uh, this camera I mainly use it for commercial mm -hmm. projects. Um, I tried to film a wedding with this, and <laughs> it was very hard. Um, it is a cinema camera, even though it looks like a DSLR. Um, I got I got a chance to use the uh, Ursa Mini Pro. Yeah. And that camera and this camera are very similar when it comes to image quality. Interesting. And but portability, this camera is awesome. I mean, it's it's lighter even than the S1H. <laughs> yeah, it is lighter. Yeah, it's great. Um, but yeah, this camera is like the image quality is really superb. It yeah. shoots raw. You can shoot 4K 60. And um, the way that DaVinci lines up for B-Roll, the file uh, format for it, yeah. it just, it's able to read it like butter. That's awesome. And you have a lot of flexibility with the B-Roll files when it comes to color grading. What, what's the data usage like? The data usage, so I shoot that one on a 500 gig um, SSD drive. Wow, just through like USB C or yeah, yeah. So yeah. USB C, like you can pin it up on top right That's here. Cool. <laughs> um, but also the this is another thing too. It's like you can actually shoot on a CF CFast card. Gotcha. And an SD card. Can you shoot raw SD? Yes. Whoa. You oh my can. gosh. I stuck in a Sandus Ultra, Ultra Pro, and I I was able to shoot twelve to one uh, raw. Holy crap! And it is it is sharp. Yeah. It's it was sharp and it compresses. I think the data rate was maybe like. I think like 50 to 70 uh, megabytes, which, wow. is, which is not that bad. Yeah, I mean, how, you know? how, how long does it blow through? What do you use, like 64s or 128s with an SD? Or? Oh, I, I have to use 128s now, yeah. but they, it doesn't actually like, it lasts two hours. Oh my gosh. 12 to one raw. Holy crap. I mean, it, yeah. if you were to pull that side by side with say H.265 or something, would it be significantly better looking? Oh, no. well, the thing is like, it also records ProRes. Oh yeah. ProRes actually looks pretty good, uh, comparable to the 12 to 1 RAW. Mm -hmm. The difference between the RAW files is like having that highlight recovery yeah. and having the blacks, cutting off the blacks. It's like it's it's like 8 bit, 10 bit, and then versus like 12 bit. You have yeah. all this information that you can compress. You're literally editing photos, photo RAWs, Every but in frame, moving, yeah, yeah, moving picture. That's cool. And if you've ever, you know, edited photo raws, you have a lot of flexibility. That's awesome. So I, I, you told me a little bit about your editing uh, workflow, which is a little bit unique, I think. Because um, if you're watching this on YouTube behind us, I don't know if you saw earlier, um, or you'll see in his graduate, he at least color grades in DaVinci Resolve, mm -hmm. uh, which especially for users of uh, Blackmagic cameras, like that's very normal. But mm -hmm. you edit in Vegas, which 
which mm -hmm. is really different. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your workflow and what you like and don't like about it and, and how you see it expanding in the future. Absolutely. So some projects I would actually use Vegas and then other projects I would actually use DaVinci. Um, I'm much faster in Vegas because I can cut and I can do easier grades mm -hmm. um, in, 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 that, uh, in that program. DaVinci, I would use it more for commercial projects and something that I kind of know what the shots are going to look like and I can assemble it pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but for a more polished look, I want to use DaVinci because I have that flexibility in color grading and because I can finish out in a higher, uh, higher bit rate yeah. than what is usual like on YouTube oh, yeah. or Facebook. Mm -hmm. So but you, do you still, regardless of whether you color grade in DaVinci, do you still do your cutting in, in Vegas? Sometimes, yeah, most of, I would say majority of the time, I do my cutting in Vegas. Mm -hmm. And then whenever I needed to export or just work on color by itself, then I would export individual file sizes to DaVinci. Gotcha. Because right now, like, uh, I tried it where it's like XML files to DaVinci. They don't really support uh, the full kind of like transfer. Yeah. So that's that's one of the workarounds to it. So what do you mean? So how did, like, once you've got your cut and it's locked and you want to go into color, exactly how do you bridge that gap between DaVinci and Vegas? So basically the script for, you have to put in a script for Vegas to render out each file individually. Gotcha. Ideally, it's, ideally it's like if you can just like save a project file in XML and just like transfer it over to uh, DaVinci, yeah. it will just render and like show you all the videos, right? Yeah. Uh, at, at, at the same as, as, as you would in Vegas, but because Vegas and DaVinci don't play well together, that's pretty much the world uh, around. Man, that sucks. You know? <laughs> but it's okay because like, you know, Sony Vegas, it renders out like, it can render out like, um, you know, high bit rate and then also retain pretty much like the color, oh, the yeah. color like the color profile. So it's not a big, it's not a big deal right now, but once like, you know, Vegas has, you know, that, that that uh, what is it that work that round trip workflow it's going to be superb gotcha for sure i mean i remember uh i want to talk a little bit about uh resolve um my wife and i and some of the other editors that we work with um had a chance to go to nab this year in vegas um and black magic was there giving like seminars every single day, like every hour on the hour for uh, Resolve because, and they they actually were literally right next to the Adobe booth. I can only imagine that they, that was completely on purpose because uh -huh. <laughs> it was yeah. cool because they had, it was like a classroom setting with like probably 50 iMacs and like one teacher oh, wow. on a microphone teaching how to edit and DaVinci uh -huh. Resolve as literally two feet away Premiere was, or uh, Adobe yeah. was talking about Premiere. It was, it was, <laughs> it was pretty brutal, but. Dang. Uh, <laughs> so it was, the editing capabilities in Resolve are blowing me away. Like probably two years ago, even I would look at it and be like, ah, it's it's not quite there yet. Like maybe on par with Final Cut or something. And I'm not, I'm a Premiere editor. Uh -huh. But now like it's, it seems like it's really becoming its own editor. Like as a thing, it have is. you considered moving moving over to that? Yes, um, I am learning DaVinci right now. Mm -hmm. I started with the coloring aspect of it. And like you said, they started adding editing. They started adding a short clip timeline where you can quickly cut things yeah even like a, a truncated version of editing you know they have pretty good media management they even added like their fusion fusion is more it's kind of like the after effects yeah. when it comes to like premiere and then also they have a delivery tab yeah so they are starting to incorporate uh, an entire kind of like a suite for a lot of filmmakers and you know i think that once once i get better at it i am probably going to switch over to davinci yeah, I mean, it's so convenient to have all those tabs just there, you know, oh, like because yeah. I'm what my, one of my main backgrounds early in my career is motion graphics. So I do like a lot of 3D animation and things. Yeah. Um, and I don't I don't think that they're there yet, like in, in terms of actually competing with After Effects. I don't know. Right. I mean, I, I'm super biased. Um, but man, they've got editing locked down, I think, or very close to it. And yeah, they have a lot of awesome embellishments like graphical things. Like when you slip a clip, like it shows the ghost of the clip behind like your actual cut it's oh like, right right it's yeah. really cool like kind of things that you'd expect at a final cut you know like little oh, right. embellishments but i'm really loving um I'm, I'm thinking about switching but after effects is too crucial for me to and just being able to they play so mm -hmm. well together with premiere but oh absolutely but yeah so tell me a little bit about your workflow like if you're going to do like a commercial so if you're shooting on 
this bad boy, the, the Black Magic. Yeah. Um, what's your workflow from acquisition to delivery? So if I'm shooting raw with the Black Magic, um, I am going to go straight to DaVinci and I'm going to cut in there because I already have the intent of shooting it in raw. Yeah. Or I'm shooting if I'm shooting a certain project, then I am going to shoot in raw. Mm -hmm. Right now, Adobe Premiere lets you re raw and DaVinci lets you read their B-Roll. Sony Vegas doesn't okay. do that, but in that in that workflow, if I if I wanted to convert, say like a video file, and I would actually transcode that into ProRes gotcha. and then bring it into Vegas. But 99% of the time, if I'm shooting in RAW, then that, that already means that I'm gonna go into DaVinci and mm -hmm. cut it in there. Yeah. And finish in there as well. Because you don't wanna lose that latitude, I guess, through conversions yeah. down the line. Yeah, you don't wanna like have you know, because B-Roll is very robust and it doesn't need any uh, transcoding whenever you put it into DaVinci. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you're shooting like a very compressed format, then you'll definitely need a transcode to start editing. So then your, your, your system's not all bogged down. For sure. I mean, I even, uh, one thing I love about Premiere, I'm not sure if Vegas has a similar feature, but mm -hmm. so I shoot usually, uh, I was telling you earlier, we do about 30 videos a month at the moment for our various clients. That's a uh, lot. Yeah, and we shoot in. <laughs> well, to me, that's a lot. <laughs> we shoot in, <laughs> usually we shoot in 150 megabits per second at 4K. We don't shoot okay. all intra. Uh, we shoot on GH, so we're shooting on GH5S right now and GH4 yeah. and stuff. Um, and so even though my computer can handle um, mm -hmm. that without skipping, even if I grade the footage, it doesn't lag or anything. Right, right. Quite often, either me or uh, my wife, who's an equal partner in the business, um, will have to edit on our laptops, like when we're at a shoot or something. Right. And there's no way that Premiere will handle like all I or even 150 megabits per second graded. Oh, yeah. um, and so we uh transcode everything to a super low bitrate h264 mm -hmm. um, and premiere has this you can link up the proxies mm -hmm. um those low bitrate files to the high res stuff and just with a push of a button it automatically switches all of your media over to the proxy oh that's awesome it's really cool so you can edit and grade and everything with the proxies and then when you want to check your grade or export you just switch right back and it's just one button it's oh yeah. so nice dude it, that's great yeah it's really good i think Ve vegas did that uh in Pro 15, uh -huh. that was like one of the reasons why I started using Vegas more mm. because of that. Before it was like transcoding, like media encoder. Yeah. Actually have to like manually like put all the files in there. But now it's like, you know, with the option of just right clicking, just hit, hey, encode all these pro proxies. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, once I get to the delivery, it just takes all of the, the high bit files and just delivers in there which is For fantastic sure. and you said that was in the 2015 release of Vegas? that was the uh the pro i think pro 14. Yeah. so does that mean 2014 is when uh, it released? no i don't think that's the year i think that's oh, just gotcha. the number yeah. gotcha because yeah. i know premieres only had that for like a year i wonder if vegas may have been first <laughs> uh, i don't know <laughs> um so for anybody that's listening um that is interested in a career in in film and might be considering uh media tech or film school in general one thing, you might, you might be hearing us throw around terms like ProRes and H.264 and transcoding and all that. Um, I think that kind of sounds daunting a little bit if you have no idea what that is. Yeah. Um, and basically that's obviously just the, the codec or the file type behind video. Um, and right, right. it just sounds so boring, but that's one of the things that jazzes me up. I don't know about you, but I love talking about codecs and what kind of stuff cameras uh, yeah. can shoot and all that. But cool. don't be scared away if you're listening to this and you're like thinking of all those, you know, big words or it sounds complicated. It's really not. And yeah. you may grow to really love that side of it. But um, so last day, I want to talk a little bit about your awesome editing machine that's about the size of a, a large suitcase <laughs> in front of me. Um, so how long have you had it and, and, and how have you built it up? So pretty much that tire, that tower, I used to have um, a th an eight terabyte RAID and I had maybe about 10 terabytes of uh, miscellaneous where I, I would put like my music files, like my, my uh, supplementary files in there. Um, but I've had that tower for, I think since 2015. Uh, mm. So probably like the last four years, it, it used to be like a full core uh, i7, but I've graduated into a, um, a 12 core AMD. And it's helped my machine a lot because I'm able to uh, focus on uh, multi-processing editing. Mm. So basically with four cores, it only has four cores to read all the, the video files. And, but with 12 cores, it's having like 12, you know, 12 cores read um, 
all, all those files. So having, having more cores is better for video editing because every core is able to offset the load. Wow. So, I mean, I guess I just choose through footage like, like nothing else. Oh, huh? <laughs> oh yeah. So whenever I, I used to render in i7 four core and man, it would be at a hundred percent full throttle with all four <laughs> cores on, but now, you know, render with 12 cores, it's like 20% oh of my gosh. each core. That's awesome. You know, <laughs> it's, it's like having four people on set versus having 30 people on set. You can, <laughs> you can delegate, you know, uh, smaller tasks and get more things done. That's a good way to put it. Um, yeah. What about graphics card and RAM and all that? So graphics card, right now I'm running a GTX 970. Nice. Which is four gigabytes. Supposedly it's made for gaming, but gaming rigs and video editing rigs are pretty similar. Yeah, for you know? sure. Uh, right now I'm running a 32 RAM, 32 gigs of RAM. Um, and I'm, I'm actually going to upgrade to 64. Nice. Because I want to get more things done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was the biggest jump for me. I, I run a Mac um, just because I'm scared of the PC system, really. Um, I went from 16, I think, which is what I bought it at, and I uh -huh. put it at a 64 or 128 in it. And it's, just, it's just completely like it, it doesn't lag at all. Like it's so nice. Oh, that's wonderful. It, it 128. Dang. Yeah. It's 16 it and 128. Yeah. It screams. Man. Dang. That's, that's, awesome. a, that's, a, that's a guy. Gigantic increase. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it doesn't lag at all. It's so nice. I could literally have After Effects rendering and Premiere going, and uh -huh. it's just completely, it's it's really nice. But That's really great. Well, anyway, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, if you yeah. are listening to this, whether it's on YouTube uh, or elsewhere, please subscribe, hit that bell icon on YouTube, um, and check out Media Tech Institute. They do free tours. Once you walk through there, you'll be sold if you're considering a career in uh, digital film and video, but they also do recording arts, like music and audio production. They're about to do acting and makeup, which I think is awesome. Like if they had had that when we were there, we wouldn't oh, yeah. have had to go, well, we still would have had to cast, but man, can you imagine how easy it would have been and, oh, yeah. and how nice it would have been to find good actors and good makeup artists. Absolutely. They also do uh, mobile app development, web design, etc. It's great. Um, they also have a campus in Houston, if you're interested. Uh, do you want to say anything about Media Tech, about your time there real quick before we head out? Oh, uh, Media Tech is awesome. I would totally check out MediaTek um, and you know use the use all the resources that you know it's available to you. The program is is awesome. Um, the mentors are you know very knowledgeable and know exactly what they're doing. And uh, man, it was it was such a positive experience for me. For sure, I still text some of those guys like, with random questions. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you again so much. And uh, again, you. subscribe, and we'll see you again next week with another podcast.